A creed, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is just a, a formal statement of Christian beliefs. Uh, you may have heard of the Nicene Creed or perhaps the, the Apostles' Creed. And a lot of Christians will, will hold to these things and, and they'll, they'll profess these kind of things. Now, the Apostles' Creed we're just going to use as an example. It's a statement of faith and matter of fact, it wasn't written by the Apostles. You might think so uh, by the name, but it was actually written... Uh, years and years after the New Testament was written. And usually, uh, in, in a creed, in, in the Apostles' Creed, it's like this, where they'll have this, this statement uh, of, of faith, and then they'll have a scripture being cited next to it to sort of justify believing in, in this one statement. And the implied argument is, you know, we know all of these things to be true from the Bible, therefore, the creed is true. And we ought to accept the creed. And, uh, and, and, and use it in worship. Let me read the Apostles' Creed to you. Again, it, it might be familiar to you. It says this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. That's the Apostles' Creed. Now, as I read that, uh, and, and you were listening to each one of those statements, I dare say you agreed with quite a few of those if you're here this evening. I agreed with, with quite a few of those statements. Uh, and there was a, a time really not too long ago when I thought, well, what's, what's the big deal with a creed? Uh, wh why don't we have a creed at Danville? Uh, what's the harm in, in having one at all? Especially if it's coming straight from the Bible. Here at, you know, what if we had one at Danville? Here's what we all stand for. We can all agree on these things, these 10 things or these 15 things. Well, fundamentally, there are problems with the use of creeds in general. And we're going to talk about four things specifically uh, that are wrong with uh, this attitude of even believing that, that we need them in the, in the first place. And, and then we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But you agreed with a lot of those statements. And the thing about teaching religious error or accepting religious error is that usually religious error contains some amount of truth. Usually religious error contains a lot of truth. And there's, there's some sprinkling there of, of some, maybe some things that the Bible, the Bible doesn't teach. And that's sort of what makes it attractive. It's that mixture of truth with error that makes it believable, right? That makes you, that, that's why uh, when someone lies to you, there's usually an element of truth in the lie. And that's what makes you perhaps fall for it and believe it. So four things quickly about, about creeds. Well, the first thing we want to talk about is that creeds prevent personal discovery. Creeds prevent personal discovery, which is a very important part of our faith as Christians. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, we're given sort of the, I think, a good pattern of how Christians should handle God's Word. Let's read that together. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Now Luke is talking about the, the Jews in Berea. Uh, Paul had come along and he's preaching the gospel and he, he goes to the synagogues first. He had visited Thessalonica and he's basically ran out of town. There was a couple people who, who believed him, but most of the people didn't. And so now he's in Berea. And he says that these people were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. And he gives us a reason why. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And so Paul had come with a message that, that interested them. And they were receiving this message. They had open ears and they had open hearts to this message. And they wanted to know all about it. They were eager to hear it. But they tested Paul's message, the gospel, with a fixed standard of measurement, with what they knew to be true. And that's God's word, what, what Luke calls the scripture, to determine whether what Paul was saying was the truth or was error. Now, this, I think, is a, is a good pattern for all of us to follow. Everybody here 
should follow the pattern of the noble-minded Bereans. We can't, we can't outsource our faith to anybody else. We just can't do that. We're all on a journey, and we're all at, at different places on our journey, but it's a journey of personal discovery. And each one of us is discovering what God's plan is and what God's Word means. And we have to know why we believe what we believe. And we have to be able to enforce our convictions with Scripture, which is exactly what the Bereans were trying to do. But that requires some work. That requires some effort, doesn't it? That requires us to open our Bibles and do some studying and maybe ask some difficult questions. That requires to test me. And I can't do that for you. You've got to do that for yourself. And to test the Bible class teacher and whatever lesson that they're giving, you've got to be able to test it with what the Scriptures say. Now, the thing about creeds, these, these short, you know, pithy statements of belief, what a creed does is it short circuits that whole process. It makes that process just go away because you're given, you're given this, this one bullet point. And so a creed is unlike a sermon. A creed doesn't reflect reasoning from the Scriptures. Creed writers don't explain how they reach the conclusions that they reach. Now, whether the, the, the statement of faith is right or wrong is a moot point at this point. They don't explain how they, how they got there. You remember in math class, maybe some of you guys, it's, it's not hard for you to do. The, the teachers, just they don't want just the answer. You can't just write, you know, here's this equation, well, x equals 7. What do they tell you to do? Show your work, right? Show your answer. They, it's not just enough that you have the right answer. They want to make sure that you knew how to get there in the right way because you could have guessed the right answer or you could have copied off someone else next to you. They want you to be able to, 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 be able to figure the problem out. You know, the, the Bible is the same way. You know, I'm not trying to equate the Bible to a math equation, okay? Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying this, this process of discernment is very, very important, and, and, and it helps us, this process of personal discovery helps us develop our own faith. And what a creed does, this, this prepackaged collection of truth claims that the church, whatever that is, doles these things out and basically says, here, believe this. Here, believe this one statement. And so what you've got is bumper sticker religion. You've got Christianity boiled down to these little short statements. And you think, as a human being, well, as long as I believe these 10 things or these 15 things or whatever, then I'm in the club, right? And I'm going to heaven. Well, accepting these creeds, this whole practice and this attitude, this leads to a dangerous habit. And we're going to, our, our brains and our spirit is going to atrophy if we're not putting in the legwork. Being spoon-fed religious slogans is not going to result in faith in Jesus. It's going to result in brainwashing. And we're going to be indoctrinated not to the gospel, but we're going to be indoctrinated into something other than the truth that's removed from the truth, at least one step removed from the truth. And so creed a creed essentially replaces Scripture. And once we start accepting, you know, things to be true just because someone else says they're true, well, then where does that end? You know, how far do we take that? If we blindly trust the creed, then we're blindly trusting the men who wrote the creed. And, and, and if the, only, the only kind of words that we should trust with that kind of unwavering confidence is God's word, is the word that comes from His mouth. The inspired Word of God. The Bible is what you have already. So it prevents personal discovery. Number two, it denies divine wisdom. Denies divine wisdom. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, you, you, you may know this, and I've quoted this maybe several times in the last couple months. Uh, all Scripture is inspired by God. Uh, it's breathed out by, by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped, for every good work. And so Paul here is writing to Timothy. He's working as an evangelist. He's, he's instructing this guy. In another passage, he says, immerse yourself in these things. Teach these things. He wants, he wants the Scriptures to be woven into the fabric of Timothy's life. 
And in this statement, he makes two very important claims about Scripture. First of all, Scripture is not of human origin. It comes, it comes from God. It's breathed out by His mouth. It's divinely inspired. But number two, he says that it's sufficient. There's an all-sufficiency to, to the Bible here that, that we need to pay attention to. The Bible is fully capable of completing us and equipping us into the kind of people that we need to be and to do the kind of work that we need to do. And so if there's something that we need to know in order to glorify God and live the Christian life, then you can take it to the bank that you can find that right here in the Bible. If there's a work that needs to be done, you can find out how to do it. If it, because it's going to be in the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible is going to, to be this, this exhaustive document and answer every intellectual question that you have. The Bible doesn't do that. I've got a lot of questions the Bible doesn't answer. But that's not the purpose of the Bible. The Bible is not to tell me what I want to know. The Bible is supposed to tell me what I need to know and to make me into the kind of person that God wants me to be, and I can be, in Jesus. And so, just by their very existence... If, if we're saying that a creed is necessary by their very existence, a creed is denying that claim. If the Bible really is all we need and 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is true, then we don't need a creed. It's, it's just superfluous. It's, it's extra. It's added. And so why not take the time that we use to, to memorize creeds and use that time maybe to memorize Scripture? That would be more helpful, wouldn't it? You can just take out the middleman, go straight to God. He's going to tell you exactly what He wants you to know. And the only answer a person can give who is maybe defending the use of a creed is, is to say that a creed provides something the Bible doesn't. It's this nice, neat, little prepackaged statement of belief. Oddly, the kind of statement that the New Testament writers are notoriously reluctant to give. You notice the New Testament writers don't write creedal statements. They don't write in, in bullet point form. They don't write with bumper stickers. They don't write with slogans. How do they write? With letters explaining themselves. It's not something that you can just say in, in 10 seconds or less. It's not like how we text back and forth with however many characters or less. They don't talk like that. And the reason they don't talk that way is because they show their work, just like a math problem. They're showing how you how the, these statements of faith are true. And so, haven't you ever wondered, for instance, you just take any, any uh, topic, but the most important topic, how, what do I have to do to be saved? How about that one? Well, why didn't the New Testament writers just take all the stuff that you need to know about salvation and, all the, you know, and just boil it all down and just give me ten things and just put it all in one letter? We can call it the book of salvation or something. And I can just go there and I can know how to be saved. You notice they don't do that. But if I was writing the Bible, I would probably do that. That's human wisdom. Isn't that how we write? When we're trying to be very clear about something, this is how we write legal codes, right? We try and be very clear. Have you ever read a legal document? It's murder. It's, 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 you, I honestly don't understand my insurance documents, I don't understand any of it. And I hate to say it, I, I don't read them. Most of them. I, I normally just, just sort of, okay, you know, I, I can't understand that. I can understand the Bible a lot more clear than I can understand these legal documents. But that's the way we write. We just, we parse every single word, right? We want to get it exactly right because, you know, somebody's going to get sued later on down the line if, if, if they didn't word it just so. So, we, but the New Testament writers didn't do that. They didn't write the New Testament like a legal code. Is it because God doesn't know how to write in a legal code? Well, that's certainly not it, right? All you got to do is read the Old Testament. You look at some of the, the legal statutes written in the book of Leviticus or Deuteronomy. God certainly knows how to inspire men to write that way, but He chooses not to do that with the law of Christ. It's written differently than the law of Moses, and God certainly had a good reason for doing that. Whether we know that reason is irrelevant. But he had his reasons, and he inspired it to be written that way. And when we, re when we replace scriptural inquiry, actual Bible study, with a list of bullet points, we can't help but really circumvent his wisdom. And, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, you're giving me bullet points right on the screen behind you. But there's a lot of talking in between those points, right? Hopefully I'm showing you my work here 
and you're doing the same thing with your open Bible. And, and really, could it be that the New Testament was written the way it is, so that only the, ki only the person who cares enough to put in the legwork is going to understand God's Word, right? Isn't this what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15? Be diligent. Be hardworking. Put in the labor, Timothy. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. If we want to accurately handle the Bible, we can't boil it down to a whole bunch of bullet points. We've got to put in the labor. We've got to put in the work. Number three, creeds fix favored interpretations. Creeds fix favored interpretations. Have you ever changed your mind about what a Bible passage taught, ever? I should see a lot of nodding heads. I should. Right. If we're honest, brethren, please be honest. You've, you've probably, at one point or another, said, oh, I didn't know that the Bible taught this. Yeah. We've all done that in our, in our journey of faith, in our personal discovery, right? Humility and honesty demands that there's no teaching. There's no teaching in the Bible that doesn't merit further study. Basic things like repentance. We're always finding out new things about that as we study the prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah. I found out wonderful things about repentance that I didn't know already. Right? There's no, there's no topic in the Bible that we could ever sort of have it all figured out about that topic. We're always going to be learning uh, uh, you know, other aspects of it. That doesn't mean that the truth of Scripture is unknowable. Right? It's just an honest admission that, that we're limited in our understanding and we're capable of error. I'm capable of error as a human being, which is exactly why you need to be testing what I'm saying with the Bible. I freely admit that. And it's unwise and it's arrogant to deny the possibility that perhaps... I might be mistaken about one or two things or maybe a dozen things, right? And I can't have this mentality that I've got it all figured out. I can think of a, a group of people who thought they had it all figured out in the New Testament. And Jesus had quite a lot to say to them. And they were the Pharisees. They thought they had it all figured out. And Jesus did not fit their mold of what, what a Messiah should be. And that's why they missed the boat. And that's why they persisted in, in their, their stubbornness. But the thing about a creed is, once, once a statement sort of makes it into a creed, or once an interpretation of a passage makes it into a creed, then it's settled, right? Because that's what the creed says. It, it's, it's beyond the reach of further study. It's been tried, it's been tested, and it's been found to be true. And by implication, because we've tried it and tested it, you don't have to. We've done the legwork. We've been diligent. And so... Uh, all the work has already been done, and all you have to do is do the simple work of saying amen at the end of the statement and saying, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. But that's not the way Christianity works. That's not the way we develop our faith. You can't skate by on someone else's accomplishments in, in, in Bible study. You've got to put in the work yourself. Each of us have to do that. Now, this is bad enough when the creed writer is right about an interpretation of a passage. He could be right. But even then, there's a danger if we accept it because it's dismantling our powers of reason. It's preventing personal discovery, right? But think about if he's wrong about an interpretation of a passage. It's a complete disaster, isn't it? Matthew 15 and verse 14, you've got this kind of scenario. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man... Both will fall into the pit. Now, when I read the Apostles' Creed, I agreed with many, many of the statements because they agreed, I believe, with Scripture. But what about the part where Jesus descends into hell? Do you remember that part? Did Jesus really descend into hell? Is that what happened when He died? I don't think the Scriptures teach that at all. I think the Scriptures teach that Jesus, He certainly died. He descended into the... The, the abode of the dead, the realm of the dead, you, you can call it maybe the Hadean realm or something, but hell, as I understand it, that's the place of eternal torment, the place reserved for the devil and his angels and those who refuse to, to accept the gospel. Really, is he in that place? But the, pa and the passage that the creed writers use to justify it, which is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, I don't think it teaches that Jesus went into hell either. 
And as a result of this creed, I just want you to see the implications of a, of a creed. As a result of that one statement, you've got perhaps millions and millions of people saying amen at the end of that, that creedal statement. And they're believing something that, that the Bible simply doesn't, doesn't teach at all. I'll tell you what, the Bible study is challenging enough without muddying the waters with a middleman statement, like a creedal statement. So, creeds fixed favored interpretations. And the fact is, we should all be studying God's Word afresh and all be um, personally discovering what it means. And all of us need to put in the legwork. And lastly, creeds displace divine authority. You know, a creed is, is not only a challenge to the authority of Scripture, but even beneath that, it's a challenge to the authority of the God who inspired the Scripture in the first place. And in a lot of religious circles, creeds are considered authoritative. Just as authoritative as, as Scripture. The creed is the truth, therefore you need to memorize it. And you need to say amen, and you need to repeat it when we say it from the pulpit or something. And again, I can think of another group of people that held up their traditions, even higher than or at least equal to the Word of God. They were again the, the Pharisees. They held these tradition of the elders. And Jesus points out in Matthew chapter 15, He points out that they had the wrong source of authority. In verse 3, he, he answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Which is essentially what, what creeds are today. And he said, For God said, and he goes on to quote from the horse's mouth, to quote exactly what God has said in the law. So to Jesus, and it should be the same way for us, to Jesus, the only authoritative words of faith and practice should be the words that come from God. And no, have, have you ever thought, no instructions are given in the New Testament on how to write a creed. There's not a chapter in the Bible that tells you how, how to write a creed or how to form a, a synod who would write a creed. And a lot of people like to look at Acts chapter 15. Remember Acts chapter 15? The, there's a Jerusalem council and people got together and then they wrote this document and they sent it to the Gentiles. Well, are the members of a synod or a council today, are they inspired in the same way that James and John were? In Acts chapter 15, I don't think that's fair to say. I don't think that's fair to, to say at all. Now, there are people, again, who um, claim to be apostles today and claim to have that authority. And if there are apostles today, we need to be listening to them, right? If, 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 if people are, are, are representatives of Jesus and they are handpicked by Jesus, then we need to be listening to these people. But if, if they claim to be apostles, then we should apply 2 Corinthians 12, 12 and test them. If people expect me to believe that they're an apostle, then they better perform the true signs of an apostle, which is what Paul did for the Corinthians and what the other apostles were able to do. And we just don't see evidence in the Scriptures that uh, God wants creeds. We see evidence in the Scriptures that we are to teach with uh, Bible study, uh, with personal Bible study, with congregational Bible study, with sermons, with prayers, with, with hymns. And so if the Word of God is sufficient, that we learned in 1 Timothy 3, or 2 Timothy 3, and the Word of God can, can, can make us capable to, and equip us to do every good work, but it doesn't equip us to write a creed, it doesn't give us instructions on how to write a creed, then doesn't it follow that a creed is not a good work that we should be engaged in? at all. And so we don't have one at Danville. We don't have one that's written down. And I would suggest to you that in circles that I've been in, there might not be one written down, but there's certainly a verbal creed. And that's just as bad. That's just as bad to say there's some unspoken creed. We need to follow only what God has said. And we can't boil God's Word down to these little pithy, you know, bumper sticker uh, religious slogans. It's going to require some thought. It's going to require some explanation. It might be more than a 30-second conversation you have with somebody about what the church is. Well, the church is, here's three words that describe it. Well, that might not be enough. You might have to get into a Bible study, and that's what God wants. He wants us to put in the legwork. <clears throat> Please open your uh, song books to the, word, or to the song that our brother has selected. I want to leave this time at the end of our service to respond not to a creedal statement, not to necessarily my, my words or the words of this eldership, 
but we want to leave this time open for someone to respond to the Word of God. And it seems to me that there's a pattern in Scripture. When the Gospel is preached, there's always a call to respond to it in some way. There's a call to make a change in your life. And if there's somebody here tonight who needs to make a change in their life, now's the time to do it. And if you've been discouraged for any reason not to, to make that change, I want to encourage you. I want you to, to, to know that Jesus died for your sins, that He took those sins upon Himself to cleanse you and to make you in the kind of person that He wants you to be, that you can be, that you were designed to be. If you're not a Christian and, and, and you've, you've never been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, why are you carrying that burden around? Why not give it to Jesus? He wants to take that burden off of your shoulders because you're not capable of bearing it yourself. And perhaps there's someone who, who has taken the plunge, so to speak, and who has committed their life to Jesus, but has fallen away and, and is making choices that are destroying his life. And you want to rebuild your life. Well, you can't do it alone. You need the Lord's help. You need the, the, the guidance and wisdom of the Scriptures. You need the love of the community of God's people in His church. And if there's any way that you need to respond to this Gospel and make the necessary change to bring your life into harmony with the teachings of the Bible and in fellowship with God, then just let us help you and come forward as we stand and sing.